Everybody, it's now top of the hour. Welcome to the sixth episode of the Intero Now Show. As always, we are happy to bring you some great content on this Wednesday afternoon. Uh, always, we go over the little housekeeping rules. Um, please, if you have any questions for any of the panelists today, please use the Q&A function in your Zoom webinar account. It makes it a lot easier for me to track everything. We are going uh, live on Facebook Live today, so uh, if this doesn't work out with you and you're cruising over on Facebook, go check us out there. Um, uh, we're going to limit the chat, but please use that Q&A function, and without further ado, I'm going to hand it over to our MC for the day, our uh, CEO, Brian Crane. Take it away, Brian. Thank you very much, Derek. Welcome, everybody. This is our sixth our sixth weekly Intero Now show. I'm excited to have Young as our special guest. We'll also have a, a, a Chris Moles, uh, our in-house general counsel with a COVID update. We'll have Daniel from Orange Coast Title talking a little bit about uh, what they can do, uh, one of our partner companies. In addition, we, we hope to have Arnie from Prosperity Mortgage if he can be found. He's on, He's on Brian. Okay, I don't see him yet. And then yeah. um, Robert Cruz as well will we'll close out the show. So I'm excited about uh, a great show for you today. Um, I hope everybody is well and healthy. I hope everybody's uh, sticking to the, to the program as far as working in a safe environment, helping your customers through this, this unprecedented time. My hat is off to all of you for the effort that you've been putting in to stay compliant with the mandate as well as to maintain your business and continue to move forward. It is our goal here at Intero to continue to feed you quality information. As Derek said, this is uh, being streamed now on Facebook Live, and it's our, our first ever uh, podcast of the Intero Now show. So I'm excited about that. And so uh, without further ado, I'm going to hand it over to Chris Moles. He's got a quick update and some, a couple of good ideas that, I, that I'd like to share with you. Chris, you're up. Thanks, Brian. I'm going to go ahead and share my screen really quick. I was, uh, and I'm, I'm told I've got to keep it within two minutes. So I'm going to try and do that. Okay. <laughs> uh, I, I'm hoping you guys are all seeing my screen right now. I got yes, the, we are. the agreement, uh, coronavirus addendum or amendment. This has been out since April 20th. It's a common form. We haven't gone over it a lot here at Intero, um, but it is very common and it's, it's being used a lot and it's a good form to use. And why it's a good form to use is because it protects agents. It's one of the few forms that's written to protect us entirely. Um, what it does is even it's boilerplate before we get to any of the inputs is it basically takes uh, the, the standard um, disclaimers of the PEAD and it incorporates it into our listing so that it says right up front, you know, Mr. Seller, you understand there's something going on here. You understand that, that there, you know, there's a disease and I'm going to be showing people property and you're assuming the risk uh, and, and the, seller, the seller signs that. So that right there is good for us. And it's why this form is, is something that we are seeing a lot more of. Like any addendum or amendment, it can't be required, but uh, it's something that, that at the brokerage we're starting to recommend. When you go down here to kind of the meat of the form, as I, as I pull it down, this first paragraph here, it, it expands on those disclaimers and it says the seller is agreeing, the boilerplate says the seller is agreeing to have us bring people into the property, which is what the listing agreement commands us to do, bring people into the property. But it gives the seller an opportunity first to say, don't do that up here in the, in the first line. Or it, it allows the seller to say, okay, bring people into the property, but make sure they're serious buyers. And we're seeing that a lot. We've been seeing that for two months now, but this actually formalizes it and makes it part of our listing agreement. So the seller can say, only bring in people that are pre-approved, only bring in people that, that are ready to buy and can buy. Uh, and if you look down here at this, this uh, 1B, it says that, it says only bring in people that are pre-approved. It commands you to make sure that anybody that's gonna see the property live, now that we can show the property live, it commands you to make sure that they're pre-approved. That's an opportunity for you, first of all, to capture a buyer, you're pre-approving a buyer. Um, but it also, it makes sure that you're not exposing yourself to a looky-loo, your seller's not being exposed to a looky-loo at a time where no one wants that to happen. So it's a, good, it's a good thing to keep in your mind to have this form signed, to have this box, box 1B checked. Right below it, there's this, this box 1C, 
that also forces the buyer before he walks through the property to represent that they've actually viewed the property online. Less important, but it's, it's again, speaks to this is a buyer that's serious about this specific property. So you're seeing these two boxes checked a lot. And I think that that's a, a good practice to use this form, have those boxes checked really quickly to close out this form without taking too much time. There is the second paragraph. Um, and if you use this form, you need to pay attention to the second paragraph for all, all forms, PRDS and CAR. If you just use the boilerplate, usually it defaults to something kind of standard. With this form, if you use it and you don't pay attention to the second paragraph, it defaults to you don't have permission to do standard things that you usually do uh, as an agent. And that might be the intent, but you have to go through each of these boxes and say, yeah, I'm, I might access the property as your agent to prepare an AVID or to prepare a virtual tour or to install signage. So I've seen this filled out where all the boxes are checked. I've seen it filled out where only some boxes are checked. I've seen it filled out where this box L down here is checked and then written to the side. It says all of the above. All of that is fine, but make sure you go over this, this section with your seller if you use this form to, to make sure that you actually have the, the proper authority to do your job. Uh, hey, lastly, Chris. yes. Oh, Chris, we got one question. Can CBA be used to cancel a contract when there is no contingency and their loan is not at jeopardy, income is not affected, and they're healthy? So that's the, that is not this. That's the coronavirus addendum, okay. right? The addendum to the, the purchase contract. Can it be used? Well, it actually has a, a section on there saying, everybody signed this. We're blowing up the deal because of COVID. I have not yet seen a seller that has signed that, right? You know, if it's, if it's in effect and then somebody doesn't really have a good faith in, in UCC reason to cancel the contract, I don't think so, but they're going to they're gonna lean heavily on it. So it, it goes case by case, and, and we can take that question offline. The short answer is probably not, but it, obviously having the, the coronavirus addendum signed gives you a lot more power than not having it signed to, to save your deposit if you want to cancel a contract. Right. Lastly, just to close out this form, though, uh, Derek, this, this last paragraph of the, of the listing agreement addendum says par, part four, temporary withdrawal of the property from market. I have seen this in my office. This is very helpful, although specialized. What we saw when coronavirus exploded was a lot of people lost their listings, a lot of agents, right? Sellers said, take it off the market, let's cancel the listing, or let's take it off the market and, and we won't market it during shelter in place. And during that time, your, your term shrunk, right? This, if you check this box and you have this form signed, it freezes time. So yeah, you can take it off the market and you can wait out shelter in place, but you don't lose your listing agreement, your hard fought listing. It allows you to preserve that. It's specialized, not everybody uses it, but keep in mind if you say, yeah, sure, Mr. Seller, let's take it off the property. I'll cancel the listing, shake my hand. You'll, you'll come back to me when it's time to sell. That handshake is a handshake. It's not enforceable. If you wanna keep your listing, you need to do two things. You either need to use this form or you need to have an addendum to your listing agreement that expands the term out an extra six months. So uh, it's, it, it's a specialized way to use your form to actually help you protect and keep your listing during these uncertain times. I'm sorry I went really fast. I wanted to make sure or you need to, I got it all in. To your so Chris, thank you very much. I, I think the big takeaway here, just like air travel changed dramatically after 9-11, Real estate sales are going to change fairly dramatically. This this addition and this addendum is, is really a great addition to to our practice in the sense that we're we're making sure we have pre-approved buyers and we have an excuse now to lean on uh, for the safety of our pre-approve our buyers and and I think that's a great new practice that everybody should uh, should be in anyway. But this is going to force the issue so. I would strongly recommend that uh, we modify our practice and use this addendum, even though, as you said, it's, it's an optional thing. It, it's it, it's a very helpful, I think, in, in helping streamline a transaction. So thank you very much, Chris. Uh, next up is Arnie with Prosperity Home Mortgage, our, our lender partner. And, and Arnie has, uh, has a, a great team of people ready to do that pre-approval that Chris just mentioned. Arnie, fire away. Hey, thanks, Brian. Great to see everybody on the call today. I think Derek was going to put up our uh, roster of folks that are available to all of our agents. And I, I think all of our agents would recognize they're available 24 seven. They're available on the weekends. And we know that like Brian was saying, our industry has changed with regard to 
how we can interact with the public. The lending side is actually pretty straightforward and seamless in terms of face-to-face -face contact. It's not necessary and our appraisers and our escrow officers are dealing with that the right way. The, uh, the virtual open house, that's a new concept. And when you're doing a virtual open house, if you've got someone you know, that wants to talk to a lender right away, that's how you're gonna get a hold of us. We're gonna send out this roster to everybody specifically on this call, but also to all of the Intero agents. And we want you to understand there's a link to directly email, to directly go to the loan officer's web pages. They can submit an application immediately. We can have it approved literally in minutes, running a credit report, getting a DU designated underwriting approval. Um, that, that's legitimate. And so the documentation to follow, you know, uh, confirming all of the application details that's you know that's where that's the secret sauce that's where our loan officers come in so appreciate your time today you know like we've been doing the last couple of days contacting all of our pre-approved borrowers that we're working on together you know we want to help you guys get people ready this market is you know active and I think month to date we've already had seven purchase applications uh, submitted this month. So, you know, we're, we're happy to be here. We're happy to help you guys and um, appreciate your time today. Any questions on that, Derek? No uh, questions. Thank, thank you, Arnie. We're, we're, we're good. Let's go to Daniel. Daniel, you're up. Hey, everybody. It's great to be here on the Intero Now show, as always. Uh, just really quickly, I just wanted to show some enhancements. I'm going to share my screen, and we're going to go to the OC Title website. It's really easy. We have 15 different title reps in Northern California that can get you set up with this tool. And really quickly, I'm going to sign in and just show you how really easy it is to work here with Orange Coast Title. So you'll notice that our new website has five distinct icons, property profiles, the ability to do farms, very important for promoting your virtual open houses right now. Net advantage for doing a net sheet at that virtual open house. Calculators that can help that person understand how much house they can afford. And when it gets to more tools, well, that's a whole seminar of fantastic ways to do niche prospecting to make sure that your brand is front of the right people. And with that, I'm going to pass it over back to Brian. We appreciate all your support. And thank you for choosing Orange Coast Title for your title and escrow needs. Great job, Daniel. Thank you very much. Thank you, everybody, for uh, for participating with our partner companies. Now more than ever, it's important that you choose the right partner, and and Intero is is prepared to to make it a seamless transaction for you. So uh, we're going to uh, we're going to bring out Leslie Appleton Young now, and and I just want to remind everybody when Leslie's done, we have a we have a follow up with Robert Cruz with with a few local stats and and a few ideas around how to implement and, and uh, execute in, in, today's, in today's world. So Leslie, I am so fired up that you have joined us here on this call. I appreciate you. I've seen you uh, countless times over the years and it's always beneficial and pleasurable to, to listen to the, uh, the stats that you come up with and, the, and some of your ideas around what's going on. So now uh, the floor is yours. The Intero Now Show welcomes you and uh, we look forward to hearing from you here. Brian, thanks so much. I'm delighted to be here. And it was so much fun to hear Chris go over the, the forms, you know, because we kind of did those forms like over a weekend. Our legal department was working 24-7, like three days straight and like, boom, here you go. And a week later, boom, here's some more. So I'm, I'm just really happy to hear, hear you do that, Chris, and, and be positive about them because we really are trying to to keep our members safe, you know, and their clients, but it's, it's really important to have these disclosures. So anyway, with that, let me share my, my screen. Let me find, here we go. Um, I am going to do this. Okay. Okay. There we go. 
And I have my um, my timer set, so um, let me just kind of get, get started here and say this has really not been the 2020 I expected. I don't think it's the 2020 any of us expected, and we're all home alone these days, but we are, we are getting through it. I think we've been, um, I'll just speak for myself, you know, that um, the denial to acceptance uh, uh, trajectory of the last uh, seven or eight weeks has been uh, pretty brutal, but I, I really sense in the marketplace that things have, have very much settled down and that as the shelter in place orders are, are loosened, as we become more sure of what this post not even post COVID, but as we work our way through it and see how business is now transacted under different circumstances, we are open for business and transaction, uh, you know, listings are happening and closings are happening and escrows are happening. So I, I think that's very much the message uh, that needs to get out there. Um, we have a very divergent um, membership in terms of how they're, um, uh, we get a lot of interesting letters at, at CAR and it's, it's really been a little bit of a, uh, an interesting experience to, um, to do this, but we're just trying to meet everybody uh, where they are and, and get through this. So I'm really going to just be answering some be basic questions about the economy, the government, mortgages, the market, the Bay Area market, and, and where we're going to go um, and where we're going to go from here and what you should be doing now. So just a really quick and, and, and some highlights. Um, so the, the first quarter GDP numbers came in, uh, they were a little bit worse than expected, but again, when you have an economy that is literally brought to its knees almost, um, almost overnight, you're, you're gonna get a big, big number and the Q2 number is going to be, uh, gonna be significantly bigger. California is losing about 31.5% of its GDP every single day as the economy uh, remains um, remains shut down, and clearly this will uh, this will change as we you know see more uh, businesses opening and and transactions uh, happening in in every uh, in every area. But it's been a very very um, big hit. The biggest really concern um, has been the loss in jobs, and it has just been so. Uh, so stunning in in the speed in in the last six weeks, 30 million people have applied for unemployment insurance. During the Great Recession 10 years ago, it took two years to get to 37 million. You know, it it just was a much slower process. So the the speed with which this is this has happened has been incredible, and the depth. Uh, the depth of the damage, you know, the highest unemployment rate in 2010 was 12.3%. We are going to be going well above 20% um, in, in the United States as we uh, work through this. Uh, consumers are, are critical to the economy. Their 70% of economic activity is tied to consumer spending. They understandably, not surprisingly, big drop over 30 points um, uh, drop in consumer confidence between March and April. March saw uh, an 8.7 percent month-to-month drop in retail sales. If you did an annual rate, annualized, a year-over-year -year rate annualized, that drop is more like 66 percent. So there are winners and there are losers. Um, clothing is off 50 percent except for yoga pants and uh, sweatshirts. I'm not kidding. <laughs> and uh, food and beverage um, is, is, quite, um, is quite strong. People are learning to cook again and they're um, apparently um, looking into experiencing the joys of the well-made cocktail. So uh, spirits are up over, over wine. So the way I would look at this is it's really like a pause button. You know, the economy has just pause. What we are experiencing is a lot more like a natural disaster where it comes in, it comes in quick and it may be you had some warning, but it's worse than you thought. And then you pick up and get going again with some damage to, to clear up. Um, and that's what I think we've got. Here's a look at some of the um, entities that do, do forecasting. And my, my point here is just to say there's too much unknown today to have a good single point forecast about anything. 
There is a general consensus that we will be off GDP about 30% in the second quarter. And then the third and the fourth quarters differ uh, depending on what assumptions are made about how quickly we get back to business. If there is a second wave, how severe it will be. Will we have to lock down again? Will we not? So part of it is the regulatory side. The other huge unknown is consumers. Even when shelter in place is lifted, do you think that they will return to the same type of living? And the answer is probably no, right? They, whenever we have a, you know, look at 9-11, someone mentioned that earlier, um, big, big changes. So there will be this time a two. The government has learned to fight the last war. And by that, I mean, they have been absolutely, um, you know, off the dime quickly to get us uh, relief. We have had four bills already starting on March 6th with a bill that helped government agencies prepare for the virus to the second round of funding for the Paycheck Protection Program and uh, through the Small Business Administration. So, you know, over uh, well over $2 trillion, which absolutely dwarfs the um, uh, the numbers that we saw during the during the Great Recession. So there have been bottlenecks. It has not been perfect, but the will has definitely um, been there. Just want to say with respect to the SBA loans, the small businesses are the heart and soul of the um, American spirit and the American economy. And the um, margins there are very, very thin. Um, I just love this slide because... Um, no surprise, restaurants are on one end of the scale, but real estate companies are um, at the other um, in terms of being in, in better shape. So I was, I was really kind of happy to see that. So in addition to fiscal policy, we have monetary policy and the Federal Reserve has done absolutely everything it can. The problem is it can't fix everything. It cannot get people back to work, but it can lower rates and it can keep liquidity flowing um, to, you know, to the bond market, it can relax regulatory requirements, it can, you know, give a forward guidance that says, look, everybody, we're going to keep rates low. So they've been doing all that they can. Should I be worried about the mortgage market? My answer to that is I hope not. Um, we've had a, a, a phenomenal increase in the number of um, homeowners that are asking uh, for uh, for forbearance. And if you have a government um, sponsored or guaranteed either explicit or implicit, you can get uh, forbearance up to um, up to 12 months. And that um, that's a concern because, you know, it's not forgiveness. You are going to have to, even though you don't pay interest and even though your credit isn't, uh, your credit score isn't going to be impacted, you're still going to have to um, to pay um, pay that money back. So we're watching those numbers uh, very carefully. I think the bigger concern is the non-bank, um, the non-bank financial institutions that act as loan servicers. They are looking at an unknown um, uh, potential for their revenue being disrupted. And it's already obviously happening um, uh, big time. And yet on the other hand, they have investors that have invested in the uh, mortgage-backed securities and the commodity called a mortgage that still need to get um, paid. So there was a little bit of relief uh, a few weeks ago where the amount of um, principal and interest they're responsible for was bracketed down from 12 months to four, but they would really like to see a liquidity facility. I think they their margins are um, razor thin. And, you know, on Capitol Hill, there's, there's two camps here, you know, let's, let's help them out versus, hey, you took the risk, you're going to pay the, uh, pay the price. But the, the part that's important for us in California, 20% of our loans are jumbo. And investors aren't interested in risky, uh, risky loans right now. So if you're, if you're conforming, you're, you're not going to have a problem. But if you're not, um, you are. And even if you are conforming, credit standards are being tightened with higher FICO scores and higher down payment requirements. So um, that's a situation we don't want to have a repeat of, um, of last time. And as I said, the policymakers are on top of it, uh, but the loan servicers are, um, are, uh, are, are going to be, you know, are feeling the squeeze. Let me just say that. So how's the market doing? Uh, once a month, CAR surveys 
we do a Google survey of Californians and we ask, is it a good time to buy? Is it a good time to sell? And the main number was encouraging. We had a, an increase from 28 to 31% saying a good time to buy. In fact, my sense of the market right now is the buyers are on it. You've got low rates. You've got this pent up demand. They, you know, if, if they still have their job, they're probably feeling confident that they're going to be able to get through this. So buy is up. And then is it a good time to sell? That took a huge hit between um, uh, February, uh, between February and um, uh, I'm sorry, between April, um, between March and April, from over 50% down to 26%, as sellers were just like, whoa, I, I don't want strangers in my house, and I'm not sure if I'm going to get my price point. I'm, I'm feeling uncertain. I'm going to wait. And this was alluded to uh, earlier in the meeting. Well, that came back a little bit in May as well. So let me just put it this way. I think the chill is going away and the market is coming to life again. And I do see a uh, green shoots. Here's data from showing time showing the, um, you know, we're still way down over last year, but we're not, not as much as we were, right? That gap is narrowing. So that's, you know, kind of the pulse of the market. The March data was down month to month and year to year. We will likely see a decline in the April data statewide of between 27 and 30 percent. We're calculating those uh, numbers right now. Prices have held, you know, prices are, are typically very sticky on the way down. And we actually saw that during the great a great recession. So even in March, we, we were up over 8% on a year, a year to year basis for the statewide median. One of the huge differentiators with, um, with uh, 10, 12 years ago is how tight, uh, tight the inventory is. And as you know, in the Bay Area, it's even tighter than this. So uh, 2.7 month supply of homes on the market, and no surprise, a big dip in pending sales um, in the March numbers. I am not going to give you a forecast for sales in California, but I am going to share with you one of our scenarios. There is, you know, it, there's so many, so many unknowns. We are looking at, you know, different scenarios based on assumptions. So this is our first scenario that says the at-home lift uh, orders are lifted May 15th. There's some social distancing throughout the summer, and there's no second wave in the fall. And under that scenario, we're expecting sales in California to drop overall in 2020, 16.7%, and we're expecting prices to drop about 3.7%. By way of comparison, the National Association of Realtors, Lawrence Yoon, um, they are projecting that sales this year will be down 13.5% and that prices will actually be up marginally at 1.3%. So, and then Zillow, Fannie, everybody's doing a forecast, but I, I did want to share with you and, and, and show you kind of the quarterly, um, the quarterly kind of breakout of, of how we're seeing the market going. So how are things in, um, in the Bay Area? The monthly data is useless right now because by the time you have it, it's all rear view mirror. So we actually are looking at daily data in California and we are calculating average daily closed sales. So here's a look at the Bay Area. The first week in March, there were the daily, let me go back, daily closed sales were 104, average daily. And the last week in April, uh, 70 uh, set six for the state as a whole. We went from six, 631 average daily closed sales to uh, to 486. So a, a pretty big hit across across the board in terms of the state and the Bay Area. The drop between um, the week of April 19th and the week of April 26 was only three point um, three point eight percent in Southern California. You had an increase of ten percent. Um, in Central Valley, it was up. In, in every other region, it was up. So I will tell you, this is the beginning of the green shoots that I was um, that I was talking about. Um, what about pendings? So Bay Area pendings, average daily the first week in March, 121. Currently, last week in April, 87. Um, in in state as a whole, 744 to 6 uh, 625, with a very sharp increase over the last. 
um, over the last two weeks. In the Bay Area, the increase was 4.1%. Statewide, it was 5.9%. Let's look, here's my other variable at new uh, listings, Bay Area 182 down to 132, but looks like it's turning a corner. For the state as a whole, a big corner being turned, 1,068, and now we're looking at 788 for the last um, month, uh, last week in, in April. In the Bay Area, that was a weekly increase of over uh, over 20%. So it's really important that the that you understand as a realtor that the market is open and that listings are being um, listings are being um, being taken. Now here um, again, this data is just going to get a little bit more uh, more granular. And I know we have people in the call from all over, uh, but here's here's a look at the counties in uh, uh, in the bay um, in the bay area. And again, a variation between, but a, but a general theme of sales are down, but they're starting to get um, a little bit better. And then here are the weekly percentage uh, changes. And for the last week, right, the last week in April, beginning of, um, of May, only three of the counties were down a little bit. All of the other counties were, were up on a week-to-week -week basis. So it's too early to call a trend, uh, but I'm kind of feeling it. I'm feeling that the bob that we have bottomed in terms of of sales, and I'm kind of buoyed by by the by the look at the new listings and the pending. So here's a look broken out by county um, of the um, of the pending sales, and and just visually look at Santa Clara. Uh, there's been five weeks where uh, the average daily pendings have been um, on the way up. And here are the percentage changes, which look very, um, uh, very good. And in fact, in Santa Clara County, they have been going up, right? Pending sales have been going up on a weekly basis since the week of April 4th. So the entire month, um, the entire month of April. Here's a look at new listings um, in, in the Bay Area and and same, I'm, I'm looking at, um, at Santa Clara with a still down from the first week um, in March, but moving um, in a very positive uh, direction. And then here's all the all those percentage changes. Now, I just picked one county. I don't have a, a ton of time, but I wanted you to see the year-to-date sales um, in Santa Clara County are off about 10.4% through March and about 19 down 19% in March on a year um, on a year over year basis. The median home price at 1.4 million in March was up 7.7%. So we are not seeing a reversal of the increase in the median price that we saw in the fourth quarter of, of, of 2019 and a very, very tight inventory with two months supply of, um, of homes on, uh, on the market. So that um, that's, you know, Honestly, when you when you look at this, my take is you're looking at a market that was the same market that we had when we ended February and got into March. Then we went through six or seven weeks where people were afraid, concerned. Um, they didn't want to do anything because they weren't sure what was going to happen. And now as there is more certainty and more acceptance things are starting to bubble and move and go again. So it's like if you're a surfer out waiting for the, waiting for the next wave and just trying to get ahead of that to have um, a really good uh, ride coming back in. Um, the other thing we've done is we've done a lot of, um, a lot of surveys um, at CAR of realtors asking them the impact. What I love about this is they see the biggest impact in open house traffic and the least impact in market competition. And to me, that's the entrepreneurial spirit <laughs> of our, um, of our uh, industry. They've had, you know, clients holding back from buying. They've had buyers withdrawing offers. They've had sellers removing their homes from the market. They've had tr some transactions. 30% of the realtors said falling, um, falling out of, um, uh, falling out of um, escrow. So buyers pulling back, uh, sellers pulling back a little bit. And yet here we look at the median price per square foot data by week. 
and you don't see an impact. So that's my point about prices being being very sticky and sellers not feeling any incentive um, to really change things. Now, buyers are expecting lower prices. And again, these are realtors saying, yeah, 87% of the realtors said, yes, my buyer is expecting a lower price, but only 30% said, yes, my seller has actually, um, has actually uh, reduced their price. About 24% of buyers are trying to renegotiate uh, be close uh, before the close of escrow. I guess you. I guess you can't blame them, but the sellers are not particularly um, responsive. Um, so let me close out with what will the recovery look like? A V, a U, a swoosh, a square root, a W. Um, again, to my earlier um, my opening comments, nobody knows. I would be much more um, uh, likely to bet on the swoosh at this point. I think the. Um, the level of unemployment in this economy and the loss, even with all of the actions being taken uh, by the government of, of small businesses, is going to be a long haul. And I, I thought this was a really an interesting quote by Steve Murray in the new Real Trends newsletter that came out uh, yesterday, where he essentially, he, what he does is he traces over the last 40 years all of the real estate cycles and what he finds is that the history of the last 40 years instruct us that recoveries are often drawn out over years, uh, years, not months. So I would not expect a, a bounce back, but I would expect a gradual, um, a gradual improvement. And you know what? There's always the possibility that this time um, it will be different. And, and I have learned to never say never about anything. What should you be doing now? You should be thinking about the market that you will be in and your clients will be in once we're more through this than we are you know, when we are now, when the economy is, is back and functioning. And I think there's some things that you really um, can pretty much bet on, right? We, this has accelerated um, the transaction uh, to be a paperless, digital, virtual, uh, virtual world. We've had these tools for a long time, but guess what? No motivation when what you were doing was working. I think we're going to see smaller brokerage offices because more, uh, more agents are going to, even more agents are going to be working uh, from home, a lot more communication and, and some positives to that with, with clients. So I think there's just a lot of new skills for all of us to, to learn. I also think consumers are going to be more thrifty and value their homes more than ever. They will need new homes or new um, changes to existing homes in order to accommodate uh, working from home. There may also be a renewed value on suburban lifestyles that are less dense and feel safer. And with a lot of telecommuting, maybe the commutes won't be so bad because you won't have to make them as much. So truly an opportunity to reset relationships with consumers that are behaving in different ways at well, as well. Who will the winners be? I believe the winners will be the tech-enabled agent. I believe the winner will be the relationship-centered agent. And I will say that as many times as I have heard that this business is all about relationships, it is also true that clients don't feel that they hear from their realtor enough after the close, um, after the close um, of escrow. So what a what a gift the pandemic is to have a reason to call a client and just say, "How are you?" I think residential real estate is going to come out of this in a very good position. Pen up demand, pen up supply, rates that are even lower uh, than they are today, and an increased value on home ownership. And then four, I will say that the commercial market is, is getting hit big time because this pandemic has accelerated the online uh, retail environment that's been there for quite some, quite some time. But what a gift to look at commercial and retail space and see a solution or at least a partial solution to California's housing affordability crisis. I think this is a once in a generation opportunity that we just can't afford to waste. So get out of, you know, I don't have to tell you to get out of your comfort zone because you know what, we're all out of our comfort zone and we need, we really do need to stay there. Um, I'm closing with just some book recommendations. 
These three are not new, but they are three of, in my career, of my absolute favorite books. And I, you know, it's about active listening. It's about better, better decision making with diversity. And it's about how important it is to have the conversations that you don't want to uh, that you don't want to have. And then here's two books that are currently being read. I have not read these yet. I will <laughs> by CAR Strategic Planning Committee. So um, I hope I stayed within my time and uh, thank you all for uh, having me and I will stay on the line. Thank you. Great, uh, great presentation, Leslie. Thank you very much. That was, uh, that was, that was a great overview of what's happening. I, I, I think my favorite quote uh, relates to what we've been doing at Intero is getting everybody kind of geared up to get ahead of the wave. And like a surfer getting ahead of the wave, uh, our Focus 30 program is designed for agents to get ahead of the wave. And, and I'm, I'm really fired up to see so many people participating in the Focus 30 program. So with that, um, I'm going to roll it over to Robert Cruz. We're we're happy that Robert Cruz has uh, rejoined Team Intero, and Robert always uh, has an ability to kind of decipher the tea leaves and, and the statistics and come up with a few interesting tidbits. So I asked him to jump on the call with us here today. So Robert, the floor is yours. Thank you. All right, thank you, Brian. Uh, thank you, Leslie, that was great information. Uh, love the slides, love the information. And uh, so it's a great lead into what I hope to bring to you in the next couple of slides. And, and that's simply the idea that, uh, you know, seven, six weeks ago when all this started, we really didn't know what was gonna happen next. And we never do, and, and Leslie pointed that out nicely. Um, but uh, we, we now have some experience, now we have some data, now we have some real relevant information on what has happened. And that I think that'll help us gauge what we do next um, really well. And so I, I wanna start with this, this idea, and, and I think Leslie set it up nicely, um, that we took a big hit. Uh, I do a, a weekly Santa Clara County update every Monday, and I was happy this Monday to share a lot of good news. It was all only week over week good news, but we need all the good news we can take. And so I shared this one, and it, and it kind of sets up the, the, the scenario, right? Uh, what happened and what should we expect? Um, I'll, I'll point out that there's an optimistic, a most likely, and pessimistic. But even the pessimistic is, is slightly up. So I think that's the mindset we have to have. Uh, that's where we have to go from here. Uh, and and I, another thing I'd like to share, I, I listened to a uh, presentation earlier this week, and uh, a gentleman described where we are as kind of a basketball game, and it's halftime. And uh, some of you are up, some of you are down, some of us are down by a lot, but it's halftime, and it's kind of a time to kind of readjust, look at what, what went right, what went wrong, and then uh, do all we can to come out strong in the second half. And, and here in the Bay Area, uh, taking the analogy further, you know, we're, we're Warriors fans. And the last several years, you know, you should know, as good as they were, they're their most deadly and they're their best right after halftime. Uh, it really accentuates all of their positives, all of their strengths in their coaching staff, their mindset, their pro everything about them. If you, if you were a fan, you would watch them. And they could be down 20 points. They'd come out in the third quarter with a new plan, new emphasis, new energy, and, and they just do a mad rush and, and, and make, up that, make up that deficit. And uh, I, I want to put you in that mindset. Um, there are a ton of things right now hitting us that we don't control. And, and ultimately market data and buyers and sellers, um, whether they want to or how they're feeling, we don't control that. But there are things that we do control, and that is understanding the markets that we're in, understanding our Bay Area markets, uh, our, own, our own optimism or pessimism, and then what we do every single day. And so what I want to do with that is I, I choose to be excited about our market, and I'm not, I'm not ignorant of what is going on in the larger picture. I am, I am deeply affected by that, like all of us, but I have a job to do. I have responsibilities to take and I can't help agents. I can't help myself and I can't help buyers and sellers if I'm not working hard to look on the bright side and, and find the information, the data and the answers to the questions that are positive. And so uh, let, me, let me share some of that with you so you don't just think I'm crazy. Uh, I think I have some actual numbers to back it up. And I'll start with this one. I love this being provided by Oculus every single day. And it just really quickly, it sets up uh, what happened post-SIP. And, and you see here uh, on that date, uh, from that date, new listings, 
just disappeared. Uh, now, but I focus on the fact that sales and after initial jump, canceling withdrawals, all kind of back to normal. And then in the last three weeks, as Leslie touched on, new listings are back up. Uh, so we, those are green shoots, as she said. Those are things to be positive about. If you've been at home, sheltered in place, really sheltered in place, and not talking to buyers and sellers, you missed an opportunity, the first opportunity. Uh, but this is, I think, the way we're headed at towards next, and I, and I want you to encourage you in that. What I'm sharing with every Monday is uh, where did those listings go, right? Where our normal March, April, Mays should be up here in new listings, uh, and they're gone. I think that in the short term has helped us in terms of while buyers have been reduced, so have the listings. So uh, the list of sales price ratios and, and the movement in the market has been surprisingly resilient and really strong. And so I use this, my made up graphic, what if we had the normal listings in the market and we are trending finally back towards that. I think we need to start paying attention to that. I told Brian the other day, if an agent was not paying attention at all to the news uh, before March 15th and just didn't listen to it and was still out there prospecting, still out there talking to buyers and sellers, they got listings and they got multiple offers and they closed and they had really happy sellers. And, and so uh, we kind of have, have that mindset. We want to be aware. We want to know what's going on out there. But then we've got to put ourselves in a position where we still do the job. We still understand that buyers and sellers need help. They have questions. Uh, they, they, they may be thinking that these are the worst times. They may be thinking it's the best time. That's why they need you. And we need you as leaders in this company to encourage you to get out there and talk to them and give them this information. And that's what's going to help us ultimately rebound. We have to make our markets. We've got to be like those warriors at halftime. They say, wait a minute, we've got the best athletes. We've got the best training. We've got the best coaches. Let's go out there and execute. And uh, I think we're starting to do that. Uh, looking a little bit, a few more numbers. Again, laying the groundwork. Uh, I want to talk about good things going on and look, good things to look forward to, but without forgetting, we're down overall. But that's where we are, right? We, we took a punch in the mouth. We tasted a little blood, but we still got our legs. We've still got our win. We've trained. We've, we've, we've been doing all the things we need to do. So now we put that all into, into the effort of communicating with our clients, communicating with our communities and getting them back to where they need to be. So I kind of, I kind of put this in there as this is where we probably should have been based on the early January, February start, but we're probably gonna end up here. But as Leslie pointed out and start to show you some of those numbers, this is now finally trending up. So please take, be aware of that and use that to motivate you and, and help you move forward. So we didn't see the late March or April that we expected or hoped for in terms of total units across the board. So market size shrunk, but the market that remained was hot. And no one was predicting, predicting that five weeks ago. So take that as a win. The overall size of the market has shrunk, but if you're active, if you're busy, there are good deals out there, right? And one way I like to show that is, I share this each Monday too, and this idea of, uh, when, we, when we take a f in, into account that there are fewer deals out there, of the deals that are still on the table, of the listings available, the buyers still looking, this is what we're seeing, right? We all remember the first, the start of 2018 and list to sales price ratio going through the roof, a real good measure of the relationship between buyers and sellers in any given market with any given amount of inventory. And look, if you didn't know we had a global pandemic going on and you just looked at this, you'd say, wow, market is really good, right? Sellers are really happy. They're putting their markets, their houses on the market and they're getting what they want plus. So even when you look at scenarios where we look at a, 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 in the next 12 to 18 months, values dropping two or 3%, that's from a really good place. So it's a really positive mindset to have uh, backed by data, backed by really solid information to bow you and keep you going and, and, and have that positive message with your buyers and sellers. So I love this chart for that reason. And all it does to me, show to me is real strength in the market. Uh, so buyers and sellers remain relatively constant with demand outweighing supply. So competition was intense and prices rose. So I think that's what you can look at immediately in the next 30, 60 days. I don't think we'll get such a jump in inventory 
or a re such a reduction in buyers in the market to really affect that. Uh, I, I, I hope you go out and get more buyers and sellers, but these things move slowly. And, and so once it starts moving in one direction and it's moving up in the last uh, 40 days, then that's generally the direction it's going to keep going in the next 30 to 40 days. Uh, now, I'm not a trained economist like Leslie, so I hope <laughs> I'm making some sense here, but uh, I, I've done this every day, every week for the last 10 years, and it hasn't failed me. So I feel strongly advising all of you, all the realtors out there to take this into account. It's good data. It's good information, good positive for those that are willing and able to list and sell or buy right now. And really, that's your audience. Yeah, it's great. It's great stuff, Robert. I mean, the, the idea that a seller can get 103% of list price is, uh, is we, we're lucky to, to experience that kind of situation. Obviously, as inventory rises, that uh, supply demand dynamic is going to switch a little bit, but this is super positive news. You're right, Brian. And I, and I think uh, the sellers are going to come back out. A uh, lot, lot of new rules coming out, making it easier to list and show. And, and remember, uh, 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 I spend quite a bit of time each money talking about buyer demand. And we know, or you should be aware, a lot of restrictions, a lot of tightening in the mortgage markets, purchase applications way down year over year, but they too started to rise. So I do feel that as we start to increase inventory, we should start increasing the pool of buyers uh, and maintaining those ratios, right? If we just go and get more listings and we don't increase the pool of buyers, that's negative for pricing. Uh, but both cratered, both dropped dramatically and far, list uh, sellers and buyers. So, I mean, this is our job. This is our job to go out and prospect, go talk to buyers and sellers, educate them on what's going on. Uh, it's a healthy market for sellers, still great interest rates, and still a long-term great investment for buyers. So look, uh, there's several hundred agents on the call right now. We all need to get on the phone and start spreading the good news. Um, and we can't do half of it. If we just go get more listings, we're not gonna be happy. And if you just go find a bunch of buyers, that's going to be uh, problematic too. But we're good at both. And, and that's the message I want to give you. The data supports a positive attitude in our industry. It supports a really good market, much smaller than we're used to. But the market that's out there is really, really good. Really good news for your buyers and sellers. I think that's a great, uh, great kind of way to wrap it up. Uh, is that the last slide, Robert? Well, let's finish on a high note. Let's pretend that was the last one. <laughs> do, you, do you have something else, Robert? Well, it was just another way, uh, and, and it, it might be obsolete now because as we know, Days on Market was taken off MLS, and that was just reinstituted starting the 16th. So uh, since it wasn't a reliable marker, um, I started using Days on mark uh, absorption rate based on closed cells as an indicator. Um, and again, using that chart, I just wanted to reemphasize this shows the appetite of the buyers in any given market. Uh, and, and it's not focused on number of listings. It's just the ratio on buyers uh, uh, consuming the available inventory. And it is just red hot, right? It is far above a neutral or buyer's market for sure. And, and so uh, most realtors don't rely on this. They rely on days on market. And so I started using it more actually for the last couple of years, but especially since they took the days on marker uh, days on market marker off MLS. So this was the last slide. And again, it was just one more time just to reinforce, uh, believe it or not, if, if you're not out there talking to buyers and sellers because you think it's all doom and gloom, um, listen, you missed the last 30 days, but it's only 30 days out of the year, right? You've got the rest of the year to go out there and, and talk smartly and rightly, I believe, about some really good opportunities for both buyers and sellers. That's, that's fantastic, Robert. Thank you very much. That was great insight. I think more now than ever, as Leslie had suggested, the, the tech enabled and, and more importantly, the, the person that can deliver a safe, smooth, and easy transaction. And, and we believe that Intero is disrupting. We're the disruptors because we're going to partner with phenomenal companies like Orange Coast Title and, and Prosperity to deliver a seamless easy, safe transaction. People do not want the inconvenience of going to multiple offices and talking to multiple different groups of people to get their transaction done. So we need to pioneer what comes out of SIP. And just like the travel industry changed and it now takes just an hour to get through the security line, 
uh, the real estate industry is changing as well. People don't want to go spend hours walking around to mortgage companies and title companies when they can do it all in one spot. So I think more now than ever, the tech enabled, I agree. And we have the tech, we have all of that available. We have more importantly, we have business partners that want to deliver a seamless, easy, convenient transaction to our customers. And that's what we need to be embracing as we go forward. So uh, to sum it all up, I want to thank everybody on the panel uh, for showing up today, Chris Moles, uh, Arnie and Daniel and Robert, and especially Leslie Young. Uh, I want to thank the entire marketing team for putting this together. And I want to, I want to also um, encourage everybody to check it out on Facebook Live and uh, become a partner with us on Facebook Live for the, uh, for the Intero Now show, because that'll be another product of, of shelter in place that we'll look back on 10 years from now and go, remember when we started the Intero Now show and the first time we ever did Leslie Appleton Young on the, on the, uh, on the Facebook Live. And, and so that's, that's where we are right now. And it's pretty cool. Uh, so great, great job, everybody. And thank you all the participants. Uh, we'll catch you on the next show. Thanks, Brian. Thanks, Thanks Brian. Brian. Great job, everybody. Appreciate Thanks, your thoughts, Leslie and Robert. Nice to see everybody. Great job. I remember going to Contempo in the 80s. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Leslie. Long yeah. time ago. I remember. <laughs> Go Take find care. some buyers. Take it easy.